Welcome back to another lesson on quantum mechanics. In this video, we're going to solve the Schrodinger equation for the free particle. Let's recall the time-independent Schrodinger equation in one dimension, which can be written as follows. On the other hand, you also have the time-dependent Schrodinger equation, which is given by the following with the time derivative term on the right-hand side. Note that i here is the imaginary number with the property that i squared is negative 1. Recall from my video on the time-independent Schrodinger equation that using separation of variables you can write the solution to the time-dependent Schrodinger equation in terms of the solution psi of x of the time-independent Schrodinger equation by tacking on this complex exponential. Of course, this assumes that your potential only changes with position and not with time. So with these facts out of the way, let's talk about the free particle. The free particle is exactly as the name implies, free. There's no potential that holds the particle back. The particle is completely free, which means that the potential is zero. As a result, my time-independent Schrodinger equation simplifies to the following when there's zero potential. If I now move the coefficient of the second derivative to the right-hand side, this is what I get. If I now also define a constant k as the square root of 2me divided by h bar, my differential equation becomes the following. This should be pretty easy to solve. I invite you to use the exponential substitution where we assume psi is some exponential function of x to show that the solution to this ordinary differential equation is given by the following, where c1 and c2 are constants derived from effectively integrating this ODE twice. You get one constant for every indefinite integration, so when you solve a second order ODE you end up with two integration constants. This means that our general wave function capital psi, which is the product of small psi and the exponential in time term, is given by the following. If we then distribute out the time exponential, this is what we get. The next thing I'll do is express everything in terms of k, so instead of e, I'll use the definition of k from up here to write my e in terms of k. And because k is the square root of 2me over h bar, if I square both sides and isolate my e, I'll find that e is just h bar squared times k squared over 2m. If I then plug this e into my equation for capital Psi, this is what we'll end up with. I can simplify the exponents by cancelling out the h bars and taking negative ik common from the first exponential and ik common from the second exponential, and when I do that, I'll get this expression for capital Psi. What I'll do next is define another constant, v sub q, as h bar times k over 2m. If I now use this defined constant, my wave function becomes the following. Now, does this look familiar to you? Well, if you've gone through my video series on partial differential equations, you'll actually see that this equation takes the form of a general solution to the wave equation. The first term represents a backwards traveling wave, and the second term is a forwards traveling wave. Now, my video on the d'Alembert solution to the wave equation gives some intuition as to why the first term is considered a backwards traveling wave and the second term is a forwards traveling wave. I'll go over that intuition here on the side. Let's consider a generic function, f of x plus vt, that looks something like this. The horizontal axis I'll draw represents the argument of my function and the vertical axis is the value of my function. Let's label this point in my function f of 0, the value of f corresponding to an argument of 0. Now when my argument is 0, that just means that x plus vt is 0, so x equals negative vt. What this means is that if t is my time, then as time increases, the position x of the point f of 0 decreases. In other words, if this initial graph has x on the horizontal axis and corresponds to time 0, then the position of the point f of 0 is at x equals 0. That should make sense. When x plus vt is 0 and t is 0, that automatically means x is 0. Now when I draw this graph for a time t equals 1 with the same function f of x plus vt, then this time the point f of 0 will correspond to x equals negative v. So what's happened here is that the point f of 0 has moved leftward in space as time has advanced. The same is true for the points f of 1, f of 2, and so on. In effect, this means that the function f of x plus vt can basically be thought of as a wave traveling leftwards or backwards, and it's doing this traveling at a speed of v. Next, we'll consider another function, g of x minus vt. Let's label a point here which is g of 0. This will correspond to x minus vt equals 0, which means that x equals vt in order to maintain the argument of g at 0. 
What this means is that if t is my time, then as time increases, the position x of the point g of 0 increases. And using the exact same logic that we did with f of x plus vt, we can argue here that the function g of x minus vt can basically be thought of as a wave traveling rightwards or forwards at a speed of v. And as a result, from this intuition, if we go back to our wave function, the first term, which has an argument of x plus v sub q times t, can be thought of as a wave traveling backwards, while the second, which has an argument of x minus v sub q times t, can be thought of as a wave traveling forwards. Now, the full solution psi of x of t of the Schrodinger equation for the free particle is a linear combination of these two components, these two waves traveling in opposite directions, where vq is a constant defined as follows, and k is a constant defined as follows. Now, from this definition of k, k must obviously be a positive constant. The next thing I'll do is I'll write the component solutions to my free particle Schrodinger equation as a constant c times the exponential of plus or minus i k times x minus or plus v sub q times t. If I want to simplify the notation a bit, I can define another constant omega as plus or minus k. When I do that and expand out my v sub q, I get the following. So essentially I have a component solution psi sub omega that represents a wave traveling forward if omega is positive and a wave traveling backward if omega is negative. This capital psi omega is kind of like the stationary states of the time independent Schrodinger equation psi sub n which we found in previous videos like in the particle in the box example. The main difference here is that those stationary states are indexed by an integer n, whereas capital psi is indexed by a continuous number, a real number, omega. In addition, those stationary states are, as the name implies, stationary. They're not dependent on time, whereas capital psi here does depend on time. Let's analyze this component solution a bit, and when you do that, you'll find out that there are a couple of faults here. The first fault is seen when you look at the speed of the wave according to the equation, the v sub q. This is given by the following expression, and if I plug in my k again and simplify my v sub q, my wave speed is given by the square root of e over 2m. However, my free particle possesses an energy equal to e. That's what my Schrodinger equation says after all. And since the total energy of the particle is the sum of the kinetic and potential energy, the energy e is just half mv squared since the potential is zero for my free particle. In this case, my particle speed or classical speed is actually 2e over m, the square root of 2e over m, as opposed to the square root of e over 2m, which is the wave speed. You would expect these two to be the same, but they're actually not, which is a bit of a paradox, and I'll talk more about this paradox in the next video. The second fault is seen when you try to normalize this component solution. So if I take the integral over the entire spatial domain of capital psi omega conjugate times capital psi omega, I end up with the modulus squared of the constant c times 1 because the powers on the exponential add to 0, and e to the 0 is just 1. When you integrate this, you get the modulus squared of c times x, but since the limits on the x are negative infinity to infinity, you get an infinite solution no matter what your c happens to be. So this is clearly not normalizable and clearly unphysical. Obviously, this is a big problem. It means that these component solutions, capital psi sub omega, are by themselves unphysical and so cannot represent physically achievable states for the free particle. It means that the free particle does not have definite energy states because the capital psi sub omega, which would otherwise correspond to these definite energies, these capital psi sub omegas are not physical solutions. But there is a way around this. Recall that when we have these component solutions to the Schrodinger equation, we can write the full general solution as a sum, or a fancy linear combination of these component solutions over the number those component solutions are indexed to. You've seen this in my infinite square well videos and my harmonic oscillator videos, for instance, where I wrote my general solution as a sum over n of those component solutions, where n was my index. But what if I extend this idea of sum over an index n to an integral over the index omega, so that my general solution capital psi of x comma t is now the infinite integral over omega of my exponential times this function phi of omega. Here phi of omega is basically my constant function, and I've also put a 1 over square root of 2 pi out front to make things more convenient for later. Of course, taking this constant out is fine because I can always absorb it into my more or less arbitrary phi. I'm going to call this equation 1. 
Depending on what my phi looks like, this full wave function is now normalizable unlike before. However, instead of being an infinite sum of discrete states, it's now a continuous sum, it's an integral that carries a range of energies and speeds. And because it carries this range of energies and speeds instead of being a sum of discrete energies and states, capital Psi is called a wave packet. It's created from a continuous range of wave energies and speeds as opposed to a sum of discrete waves. It's a bunch of waves packed together continuously. Now, just like how we determined our index constants in the previous solutions to the Schrodinger equation, we also need to determine our phi of omega. How do we do that? Well, we use the initial condition, which will be specified at the beginning when we solve the Schrodinger equation for the free particle. From equation 1, this means that the initial condition can be written in terms of phi of omega via the following integral. We can then use something called Plancharel's theorem, which I'll go over in another video, to write down our formula for phi of omega. According to this theorem, if I write my initial condition in terms of phi with this integral, then I can write my phi in terms of my initial condition with this other integral. So finally, the general solution to the Schrodinger equation for the free particle with the initial wave function of capital Psi of x comma zero is given by this infinite integral where my coefficient function phi of omega is given by this formula. Now, if you go back to comparing my initial wave function and the coefficient of phi, you'll see that these two integral formulas resemble something important. Can you think of what that might be? Well, it's the formula for the Fourier transform and the inverse Fourier transform. It just so happens that phi of omega is the Fourier transform of capital Psi of x comma zero, and capital Psi of x comma zero is the inverse Fourier transform of phi of omega. Of course, in order for all this to work, all this integral business with the phi's and such that we've done, in order for all this to work, our initial condition Psi of x comma zero must at least be normalizable or already normalized. Anyway, that should do it for this video. In the next lesson, we'll continue analyzing the solution and provide a bit more context to a few things we went over. I'd like to thank the following patrons for their support, and if you enjoyed the video, feel free to like and subscribe. This is the Faculty of Khan, signing out.